Now we're going to move forward, leave salt for a while, and talk about some igneous structures. Um, here I've got some little cartoons showing you some of our terminology. We talk about igneous rocks. We remember that those are rocks of magmatic origin. They are frozen, sort of what we think of as original rocks, or at least I do. Um, we talk about intrusive rocks. Intrusive rocks are underground. These are those plutons that come up, those batholiths, those huge uh, injections of magma. You've also got dikes and sills and sheet deposits and all of those are intrusive rocks. Extrusive of course is when the magma becomes lava because it's at the earth's surface. That can come out of volcanoes, it can be marine volcanoes, um, it can be the slow sort of peaceful flows of Hawaii or the pyroclastic explosions that you get with your rhyolitic uh, felsic magma. So you know, we've, we've got magma as the melt phase, it, it oozes through our little networks of cracks and creeps along grain surfaces to come up from underneath the crust where you've got the uh, more molten behavior. The pressure difference between the magma, which is very high, um, and magma often has a high volatile content, which really creates even more pressure, and your surrounding low pressure rocks will often drive a lot of fractures and cracking and uh, force some sort of disruption of the bedding. So there's a lot of structures left behind to recognize this. Um, of course, batholiths are huge, plutons are smaller, stocks are even smaller. But when we talk about big and small, I mean, even a stock is this little blob up here is defined as being just a couple of kilometers in diameter. So these are all really, really large. And then there's this word, hippabithal. And that just means that these are more shallow um, injections. Uh, the difference can be important because obviously a shallower uh, stock or pluton in the crust is going to freeze a lot faster. Its level of crystallization is going to be lower because of that. It's going to have different structures associated with it. So it's nice to know what that word means so you can throw it around at uh, cocktail parties and sound like an egghead. <laughs> now Let's go into some sheet intrusions. These are other uh, igneous structures. You've got dike swarms, and these kind of form in little sub-parallel clusters. And uh, like it says here, we're perpendicular to the direction of least principal stress. That may not mean a lot to you right now, but very soon, probably the next lesson, we are going to start to define these directions of stress, the strain that results from them, and, you know, it can be a little bit like beating your head against the wall because there's math involved, but it's very important because you need to define how these events have happened and it is worth the effort. Um, now, dike swarms also, if you see this little cartoon here, they often form in a distinctive array of little rings and radial dikes around volcanoes uh, because that's where huge uh, deposits of magma are being injected uh, into the surface crust and they are disrupting the formation that was already there. Um, and these injections create faults that can be filled with the higher pressure magma or are just faulting to allow for the the space difference because magma's coming to fill up the space. Um, the fault arrangement and the consequent dikes indicate complex stress arrays and so later when we can really kind of qualitatively define the stress, we're going to be able to talk in more detail about what these arrangements mean and why they're that way, why these are in a ring around the volcano and why these sheet dikes shoot out radially once you get further away. Now we'll go down here and we'll just quickly talk about some extrusive features. We all like to talk about uh, lava and volcanoes or at least all the geologists I know, so I'll talk a little bit about that. We have Pahoehoe and Ai-Ahi flows. And what's the difference in that? I think most of us probably know at this stage. Pahoehoe is your ropey, thick, viscous, you know, slow flowing lava here, and it just gets all stacked up like this. Um, excuse my cartoons, but I had to use pictures that were mine. Don't want to infringe on any copyrights. Um, Ahi Ahi flows are a lot less viscous, so they just, this is kind of my idea of an aerial shot of a big flow here. And what's happening is it flows a lot quicker, can create these little narrow channels and stuff, and it 
these little bits here are auto brecciation and that's just that some of the magma is freezing as it flows along and then those those breccia pieces get kind of rolled back into the magma and it all becomes kind of messy as you can understand what you're seeing later on when you look at it if you understand what's happening when it's freezing when the rock is actually sort of forming this is a uh, well, it didn't come out quite as illustrative as I'd like, but these are pillow basalts being sort of extruded under under the water, and it's the water that causes them to freeze so quickly as they come out that they have these big pillow shapes, and they can be very distinctive deposits. Um, and then we have ignimbrite deposits, and those are due to the pyroclastic flow, to the pre-magma flow, to the ash fall that can come out at the initial um, explosion of a volcano. So I drew a little thing here to illustrate how the ash cloud comes up, and it creates enormous amounts of ash uh, when, a, when a volcano does explode. And then you've got this little forefront. Um, the plug that pops out before the uh, lava oftentimes is full of, depending on the volatile content of the, the volcano and everything, uh, it's full of hot gases and ash and just uh, these glassy sort of starry pieces that have been forming to wait for the explosion. There's just a bunch of junk, and that's what the ignimbrite deposit is. It's not plain old lava flow igneous rock. It's it's a messy kind of junk deposit that's usually underneath the lava flow. Um, and then here you've got uh, what we call a flow foliation. Usually in a rhyolitic lava for instance it's got a high silica content and so it's a lot more viscous, it's slow flowing and um, what can happen is you've got differential crystallization because it's not really homogeneous, is it? It's a uh, heterogeneous, and it doesn't. It's not as miscible as a, uh, a less viscous sort of basaltic flow that can attain a higher level of homogeneity. It's um, it's more separated, less easily mixed together, and so little streams of this or that may crystallize out. They stretch out because they're still kind of melty and gushy. They stretch out along the direction of flow, which is good because later this can help you to define uh, how the flow is going. And uh, we, they also create little microstructures that we'll probably talk a lot more about later. And then as magmas dry, they often show this columnar jointing. And you should Google some pictures of that. It's very interesting. They they usually display this sort of hexagonal um, shape. And what this is this is it's a stress strain relationship as it as it freezes because the the density changes and it has to kind of break up and fracture along certain planes and this is how it does it and later we can talk about that when we understand the stress and strain but it's a very interesting structure to look at I can say that and um, finally we'll move on to a uh, last couple of interesting structures of course these are rare they're not the kind of thing you run into all the time but we've got impact structures and the most obvious of these are going to be like a crater and um, you'll see some of the associated little things with the crater notice here you have this really deep crater. Let's think of that one in Arizona, for instance. And then you've got a couple of layers here. First, you have this crater breccia, because when a crater that size is formed and an impact of that magnitude took place, it is going to mess up these underlying beds. So there is some chaos here. There is some extreme heat driven uh, melting and just interesting things. You can see shocked quartz in these areas. It really can't be formed by anything other than uh, the kind of impact that a, a, a meteorite can make here. Now, um, what happens is, imagine this. You've got this come in, it crashes, a ton of junk flies into the air, and then you get a fallback breccia. That's what's here. Uh, you have some sediment that's going to be deposited over it because these are old. This has been eroded away. It used to be even taller. That's what that's meant to show you. Here you can get some overturned beds because they're just kind of thrown back. I mean, it's it's amazing to try and imagine what it is that went on here. And then you can see some of these smaller structures in the rock that will help you to sort of place. These shatter cones are interesting because this little apex here points in the direction from which the impact came. So you can um, define an angle that this this uh, crater was formed out, you know, the object that hit it, you can define the angle, where did it come from? And um, then you've got this pseudo-tacolite, and what happens is when 
this huge amount of kinetic energy is is kind of transformed into heat energy as the impact takes place. Temperatures as high as 1700 degrees Celsius can take place. And so a lot of stuff melts, you can imagine. And it's a mess, and it's it's this right here is your big pieces of breccia. And this here is a glassy matrix. Those are stretched, melted breccia, and glass that can't even be defined as, as what it was originally anymore. And it just it hits there, it melts it, and then it pushes it down into the breccia that wasn't melted. So you have a very distinctive glassy matrix with big pieces of breccia in it that defines these impact environments. And while on Earth, this is very important because the moon, for instance, has no tectonic activity. You can see craters on the moon that happened eons ago, and they look about the same as they did when it first happened. Well, you don't really need clues to tell you that that's an impact structure. Now, here on Earth, it's a little bit different because our tectonic activity buries the evidence. It breaks it apart, it covers it up, it moves it, it disrupts it. So we can no longer see an obvious crater in most cases, but if you consider the history of these impacts, although they're rare, they're very important to the history of our planet, a lot of important events and extinctions are associated with them, so it's important to be able to recognize them. And if they've been buried in the sea or torn apart, when you see these things like the shatter cones, this shocked quartz, that, that that's a form of shock metamorphism. You have um, forms of it like say stishavite that's that's one of the forms of the shocked quartz when you see these things that couldn't happen um, just in your normal sedimentary environment they can help you to draw out the history that's kind of hidden in the rocks and uh, if that's not interesting I don't know what is interesting and so I think here we're going to end this first lesson and this has just been kind of an overview of the basic structures and terms that we're going to start to use later on we're going to get a whole lot more specific we're going to get into the details and eat the meat of this subject and I hope to see you in my future lessons this is Kathina and I am signing off